It's a real honour and a privilege to give this memoriam to John Ramsey. For someone as iconic as John, it's hard to know where to start. And I've taken the liberty of inviting a few of our contributors to reflect on John's career and contributions. Hopefully between us, we'll give you a picture into John's life. For me as a student in the early 90s at Leeds University, Ramsey was all about Ramsey and Huber, volume one on strain analysis and volume two on folding and fracturing. These volumes were also later followed by volume three on the application of continuum mechanics to structural geology. But of course it all started much earlier than that. John was born in London in 1931 and completed his bachelor's degree in geology with first class honours at Imperial College London in 1952. He started working on his PhD, looking at strain patterns in the Loch Mona area of the Scottish Highlands with John Sutton. And after a brief period of military service, he then rejoined Imperial College in a teaching position in 1957. In a conversation with Rod Graham, one of John's early PhD students, I start by asking Rod about the first time he met John. I went to IC to do a PhD and he was actually at the end of his sabbatical and he'd just sort of driven around the world. And Pete Hoddleston and I went to meet him in the Alps on the Lookmania Pass. And that sort of first time that I had met him was in a in in a Volkswagen camper van on Lookmania. And we had um, dinner and lots of drinks. Um, that was the first time I met him. Uh, I was enormously impressed by the sophistication of the camper van, courgettes and fancy stuff like that. <laughs> so he'd just been on a sabbatical and had travelled around the world today. So yeah. just been, yeah. yeah. I, I think he'd been on sabbatical in, uh, in California, probably. Um, and they took a boat, I don't know whether they did Australia, but they certainly drove back um, from India through um, Pakistan, Iran, and all the way back through Europe, all in this VW camper back. And so I wanted to go to the Alps um, and work, did a, do a PhD in the Alps. Um, and that was the idea. We got then to IC and um, Mike Coward was a new research student at the same time. And Mike was, had been in the Hebrides and was hugely enthusiastic. Said, you know, what do you want to go to the Alps for? We know all about the Alps. You know, we, we don't know about the Hebrides. Come with me and you'll see some really good things. And we went in February to Hebrides and I went up the west coast of North Uist, which is utterly spectacular. I don't know if you've ever been there. Um, but the fold structures and the, 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 the sequence of deformation, which is what we were all doing at that time, is fantastic. And um, so having seen all this, I thought, well, actually, yeah, I'd like to work here. And went back and said to John, look, there's all this there. Um, would, you, um, would you do half? And he said, yes, I'd be interested to do half. And that's how it was. I mean, so Janet was actually my main super. Said that I always was very close to John. And of course, it was in it was in North Uist, in that area of North Uist, when I finally got everybody together and did a trip there, that John realized that these shear zones that I was just mapping as shear zones, you know, were actually one or two of them. <laughs> um, I, 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 the, 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 the fabric started in isotropic rock at 45 degrees to the shear direction. And of course, that's how that shear zone paper came. It was simply because John did a visit to the field. That year. I mean, I, I didn't think it was very, very much special about them. I knew what they were. And it was ductile deformation in zones in otherwise undeformed rock. But I didn't realize the geometric significance of the fact that you could then prove the stuff that John had uh, in his head about uh, simple shear geometry, which of course well, the book hadn't been written then. It was, the book came out the following year. So it was, it was all quite interesting. <laughs> the book that 
rod refers to, of course, is the folding and fracturing of rocks. My copy, a more modern version, signed by John in 2017 at the special EGU, commemorating some of his work. The book was published in 1967 and it was really, I guess, a game changer in structural geology at the time and it's what really put John Ramsey on the map as a structural geologist. At the same time, he launched an MSc in structural geology and mechanics at Imperial College. And together, this really um, made Imperial College at that time a hub for structural geology and a hub for structural geology training. And many of the people that sat that course um, then went on to do great things in the world of structural geology. The book puts together quite complex um, concepts very clearly and I think this is really one of the main things that um, John contributed to structural geology was this clarity of thinking and his ability to illustrate that both f through beautiful photography, the maths behind it, that really made this, I guess, a bestseller in structural geology. Yeah, as a student, I, I read his classic 1967 book, um, and that, that's what turned me on to structural geology, I guess. The, the other thing I would say that, that um, as my, my career has developed, the thing I, I take most inspiration from is the way he puts together teaching materials. Those, those classic books that he did with, uh, uh, with Huber and, and then Lyle are really clear ways of describing how to take apart rocks from a structural standpoint. The clarity of the illustrations and the clear explanation of the of the methods and 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 what you get from them is it is is really inspirational and, and they're, they're some of the finest teaching materials that you can find in structural geology or in any part of geology yeah i totally agree because obviously that's my era those books are my era and they were my go-to as a as an as an undergraduate in in leeds as well um mm. and i yeah just that the clarity of the visual, the visual descriptions, both field and diagrammatic, and then the link to the mathematical um, geometric descriptions are just, yeah, they, they are so clear. And, and I think you're right there, that, that ability to communicate um, what to some people could seem quite complex, um, even though John Wheeler would say it's only geometry. But um, <laughs> but that yeah, that those textbooks for me were inspir were an inspiration for for my career. Yes, and I think actually that 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 comment, <laughs> the quote from John Wheeler, is is an interesting one because both John Ramsey and I, I both come from a standpoint that if you, unless you have the geometry right, you can't really do anything else. Uh, and so you, you need to get the geometry, under, understand the geometry. The, the, the other point about those teaching materials are that I think they, they were also really important for demonstrating the virtue of taking numerical approaches from, from things that don't apparently look numerical to start with. John's time on the staff at Imperial College was clearly a key component of his career. He published some really fundamental research papers he was made a professor in 1966 and published Folding and Fracturing of Rocks the following year in 1967. He also set up the Structural Geology Masters at that time. And as Neil Manklow from ETH Zurich, where John ended his career, says in his obituary, the Masters course was hugely influential and whose attendees are like a who's who of the next generation of international structural geologists. John really made a difference to a lot of people's careers. And it was in 1970 that he was initiated the first tectonic studies group meeting and it had its first meeting that year at Imperial College in London. What I really get from talking to people is just how generous a person um, John Ramsey was, particularly in communicating with and supporting the careers of younger structural geologists. And I think this is what really stands out when I've spoken to people. And you must you must remember what sort of hero figure he was at that time. I mean, in, in a lot of university staff in the mid sixties were a bit sort of standoffish and, and you know and didn't fraternise with students. But we always, uh, I mean, Jay Cossack and 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 me and Mike 
Coward and various other people used to throw a party every year at Christmas. And John and John Sutton and Janet Watson always used to come and we went to lots of parties at John's and they were absolutely terrific and we we met all kinds of people that way and I was I never was um I w w was always utterly impressed by John and his sophistication and his knowledge of the world and his knowledge of music and and so on um, well I first met John um just as I was finishing my undergraduate um mapping in um the Moin Thrust Belt in the southern end of Loch Erebol, and he was leading a trip of uh, students from Zurich around the area, and um, we sort of bumped into each other in the field, and then I, I joined him and that the gang in the Smoo Cave Hotel, and there was a fairly raucous evening and sing-song in the bar. He, he was always really open about discussing ideas, and that, that was one of his really great strengths, that he, he wasn't um, precious about what he did. He was very minimal to discussing um, you know, the what thing, you know, he, he wouldn't be, a, it's not really the right way to put it, but he wasn't afraid to talk about rocks he'd only just sort of bumped into. And, and that meant you could have really good engaging discussions about, about their significance and how you might tackle them and, and what it might mean. Actually, that's another thing that we should say about John. He was enormously encouraging to, um, to, to early career people in general. He, he uh, certainly, you know, th th while he was professionally employed, he, almost never missed the Tectonic Studies Group annual meeting, even though he's based in Switzerland, and, um, and always came and was, took delight in the, in the breaking research that was presented by students and other early career scientists, and would always go to talk to people about stuff. You could, you, you, people would quite happily walk up, if he was in the line for lunch or at the bar, you, even if it was a subject that he hadn't previously published or worked on, he would be happy to talk to people or actually ask them questions in those informal system, uh, settings. I think he's, he was, that, that those approaches are, are really admirable and, and it's sort of small scale leadership from the, by dealing with the grassroots rather than standing on a great pulpit and pontificating, which was never his style. Yeah, which is which is lovely. One of his legacies is the um, Ramsey Medal, which was designed for early career researchers, people's kind of first paper, their PhD paper. And um, you know, when I met him at TSG, he he was delighted to be able to award the Ramsey Medal. Although it is worth pointing out, of course, that he didn't set it up, but he lent his name to it, and he was very um, proud to lend his name to it. Um, it's not the sort of thing he would have done himself, if you like, in terms of creating that kind of um, medal with his name on. I think he was initially slightly amused by it, but I think he, in, 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 as, yeah, exactly, yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's not the same yeah. ego. We all have ego, but he 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 didn't play it in those sort of public ways. Although John was at the University of Leeds for a very short time between 1973 and 1976. He had a similar effect on structural geology there as he did at Imperial College and left behind a legacy in which the department is well known for structural geology and structural geology expertise. After Leeds, John moved to Zurich in 1976 and this is where he spent the rest of his career, spending time both in Zurich but also in France at a family home. John continued to work on the Alps that he loved and also did a lot of stream work which was um, followed quite significantly in Europe um, as the Brits began to move into more I'll call them arm waving processes but balancing cross sections and thinking much more about bigger scale tectonics. This is something that John never did and both Rod Graham and Rob Butler reflect on this. And, and John did could impart this enormous enthusiasm for just observation for just looking at things and describing them and then uh, suggesting what they might be in terms of mechanism and, and so on, like, or, but always on a small scale. Yeah. What he never ever did was take it onto a bigger scale. And he was always very against it, actually. It was really quite strange in those days. He would not, would not go beyond the, the, the limits that he was absolutely certain of. You know, yeah. so the idea of, I mean, I remember talking to him about this many times, you know, the idea of trying to somehow bridge the gap, the kind of tecton the kind of structural geology we were doing 
and plate tectonics, which was relatively new then, you know, yeah, yeah. That there might be links between them. He was very, um, again, it, you know, he, yeah, so he, he, was... he, he didn't, he, he didn't have any interest in doing that. Really, his, his, his work on strain never really was taken on by the by by, Brit, by the british community not in not 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 to a huge extent other communities really did and um they they did in the early part of the, through the 70s but but when there, there was a wholesale change into cross sections and so forth that that john was never really interested in he was more much more downscale and i think there's still an issue about uh, about how you upscale the sort of work that john was doing to do what amounts to tectonics and that was never really his passion John was British, but he was very influential across Europe and internationally, particularly on strain. Here he is at the Wren meeting in the 1980s with many well-known structural geologists. He was very international in his view and um, Rod Graham reflects on this as being one of his great strengths. The other thing that John did, it was his internationalism. So when um, I got to know people like Jules Deramont and, uh, and, and Jean-Pierre Brun from the field trips that we all did, it, 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 even pre-TSG pre uh, as such, it, John did a field trip, he invited all these people because he knew them all, and so we did. And we had some fabulous times in fabulous places and learned a huge amount. But it makes you realise that you're not in a tiny little world. And uh, loads of, you know, I met lot, made lots of friends through all of this. But again, it was down to John, yeah. fundamentally, and his internationalist view of things. John continued through our his life to have a passion for other things. He was an accomplished cellist and when he did his military service it was in the musical corps that he served. He continued to play the cello and compose throughout his life. He also wrote poetry. John's poems tell us a bit more about his life from his cockney upbringing and working class roots and slight antagonism both with Cambridge and Oxford but also with industry and the use of seismic image data. The purity of his thoughts in that respect are quite interesting and of, and of the time. The poems also link to singing which was common at the time on field trips and in bars and with the creation of specific songs about geology and geological field work. So in many ways, John was a polymath and interested in a lot of different things. But the thing that really strikes me is his appreciation of beauty and beauty in the detail of things. And there was one marvellous occasion when, which is, has got some structural relevance, we went there and, and John had a table, which we were all having drinks off or coffee or something. And it was made of Connemara marble. And I said, my God, John, this table is just unbelievable. It was all dioxide marble and, and flow falls all over the place and so on. And he said, yes, he said, it's wonderful, isn't it? He said, there are three PhDs in this table. <laughs> the, 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 the perception of the small scale intricate Pattern. Yeah, that detail. But fascinating. Yeah. He was yeah. obsessed by beauty. John was really well known for his mapping. This is his map of the Loch Mona region that he created during his PhD that the Sedgwick Museum in Cambridge now hosts. It's John Dewey. He, see, he, he would put John Ramsey as the, at the pinnacle of field geology. Yeah. In terms of the, of the beauty of his field maps, the detail and the rigour of the observations and their recording of it, um, which is entirely a reasonable opinion. After John's death at the start of 2021, I approached Karen Mayer, who's been doing some sonification of different scientific data sets um, about the possibility of trying to sonify some of John's kind of fold interference ideas. 
I guess my first meeting with John was 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 on paper, right? So it was it was reading the structural geology textbooks when I was studying um, geoscience, and I think what what struck me with those was was just the clarity, was the image, the 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 the, the, the sketches, the drawings, and the, the clarity of those. They looked nice and they were clear and they they gave me the message. But they were they weren't institutionalized. They they were kind of they were somehow beautiful in their simplicity. Um, and, but they got this point across. Um, I think that was kind of the, that was one of the, uh, that was the first thing and that, 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 that has, has, um, has stayed with me that, that you know, um, that's one of the underlying things I think about his work that's, that's so inspirational. He, he didn't complicate things. He, he took a very complicated um, uh, set of geological processes and he, he, he revealed them to to students and to the and to the public, I think. Ways the work that you're doing now also is really around that kind of communication and um, exploring maybe quite complex topics in in, di in different ways. Yeah. So I've um, I recently been uh, I took a, a a couple of years out of uh, science and I, I've been studying sound design at the University of Edinburgh, um, and 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 part of the motivation for that was to to use sound to communicate um, scientific concepts um, and hoping to reach a, a broader audience um, than we often do in our scientific papers, R rather than doing a very simple sonification where, where I just map some graph to pitch, which is, is a way um, previously scientists have used sound. Um, I wanted to go a step further and explore how I can start to create a, a context. I can put you in that environment and use sound design techniques um, to, to kind of play with you a little bit and, and, and give you an experience and, 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 and try to immerse you in, in a, like a geological process or a, um, a, a data set or a, a piece of information. And of course, John's, I'm going to say other skill, I suspect he had quite a lot of hidden skills as well. <laughs> John's, yeah, John's other skill was in music and he was a very accomplished um, cellist but was also a composer so for him music clearly spoke to him and communicated with him and you know created a richness in 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 his life so i yeah. i think that's a you know there's a really nice connection there in terms of kind of john and and his skills and and interests the, the key thing with the fold um, sonification that i did was um to mimic um, geological folds um, just by sine waves um, and, and what I've, I've ended up doing is I've, I've tried to um, I've tried to mimic the process of fold interaction at somewhere like Molnar you know in the classic um, field areas that uh, that John described um, but but to really try to um, to follow um, the, the the folds interacting so so over over printing each other um, and then this full, full interference what I've done is I've, I've used um, frequency modulation synthesis so I've used I've used a technique that that technique was was actually um, discovered in 1967 so that's right when um, John was was uh, publishing his, his first papers on on, on these, this topic this was when in in the field of sound synthesis, um, people were first using uh, some of these techniques.
piece gives us a bit of an idea of the breadth of John's impacts across a range of both science, music and art. What you do notice, I think, is the recurring themes that come up around clarity, communication, beautiful descriptions, love of nature, and then this kind and fun and generous man. I'm going to leave this talk now with a few final reflections. There will never be another John Ramsey. It's, uh, it, I, I think there's, you know, the, the, he's a product of his time and the, the I mean, just look at what his, his PhD was not going to be in structural geology. It was meant to be looking at this tract of the Moyne and was, was essentially, would, would ideally have been a, as what we'd now call a sort of a, a basin analysis. It was meant to be largely stratigraphic. And the, so, and so those sorts of those sorts of opportunities to then step sideways into completely different branches is actually really rare. And um, so, I, and I think without those opportunities, well, who knows what would have happened? So, uh, yeah, and, and John John was a unique character anyway. What, what, what can you say about him? I mean, a very very fine man who um, influenced us hugely. I mean, we're all deeply grateful was an absolutely terrific guy and hugely generous and 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 good fun yeah <laughs> he was